a lot of great information for you. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Abby, who is our moderator today. Abby? Thank you. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for the Shrab Town Hall meeting. We have presentations today from Dan Stokes from the NHPRC and from Dennis Pritzler and Laura Palma Bradford from the Arizona State Archives. Dan is up as our first speaker today and he, Dan is the Director of State Programs for the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, also known as the NHPRC. His bachelor's and master's degrees are from the University of Cincinnati, where he studied history and historic preservation. He began working for the NHPRC in 1987 and was appointed director of the state programs in 2009. Okay, are we ready to go? All set? Thanks, Dan. Very good. Okay. I uh, wanted to bring you up to date on money issues and then state board issues uh, over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, when we finally did get an appropriation for 2020, uh, we actually got an extra half million dollars this year, so we have $6.5 million to work with through September of this year. Uh, the 2021 budget request from the White House is for zero funding, which it has been for the past few years for us and for others. Um, Congress has not started their appropriations work yet. They always wait for the president's budget to come out in early February, and then uh, they usually start in the spring or summer to do their committee work, uh, where it starts in subcommittees and the work is its way through the appropriations committee and then finally up to the actual body, either the House or the Senate. Uh, we have no idea what's going to happen in either of those. For this year's funding, the House had passed a, a appropriations bill with $7 million for us, and the Senate had passed, the Appropriations Committee had passed a budget with no money for us, and then somehow we ended up with this $6.5 million through who knows what kind of negotiations that went on. So it's hard to know uh, what may come out this year. Uh, because it is a presidential election year, that brings even more uncertainty to the whole process of when appropriations will be passed. There's often this strange time between um, the election and the inauguration where if the House, the Senate, or the White House have changed parties, people will either scurry to get work done before a new uh, Congress opens or a new president is inaugurated, and if things haven't changed, they'll often just sit and wait and not do anything. So um, the election will have a lot to do with uh, what happens with our funding. So we all just sit and wait and do our work and uh, keep our heads down and hope for the best. So that's our uh, information so far here. Now getting on to uh, more interesting topics, uh, at least for me. Um, for this year, we awarded 15 states uh, board grants, totaling about $480,000. This is a few hundred thousand dollars less than we did in the past, and it's not because we gave fewer grants, but rather the states that came in uh, asked for less money, or the states that usually ask for $65,000 to $80,000 were not up to be uh, considered. They have often have two-year grants of up to $80,000. So um, we gave about the same number of grants, but we gave less money because they, that was requested. Uh, it should go up again next year because we have several states that have two-year grants that will need to apply again. Um, I wanted to note especially South Carolina and Virginia who got their first grants in several years. Uh, those were awarded finally because um, for South Carolina, the governor actually appointed board members. Um, the previous governor hadn't done that, and so that meant the board went dormant. And Virginia, it was just staffing issues, um, mainly of not having a state archivist um, for a while. And then finally, when uh, the archivist of Wyoming moved to Virginia, one of the first things he did was to get the board reactivated. So we were glad to support those two states 
for the first time in about five or six years. So for uh, the coming cycle, the drafts are due April 1st, and then the uh, final applications are due June 10th. Now, this should be for anybody who is going to be running out of money uh, by December 31st because you will need to uh, be discussed at the November Commission meeting and then approved for grants starting November 1st or January 1st of 2021. So if you're going to run out of money by the end of this year, make sure you apply. Or if you are ready to apply as a first-timer, um, or first time in a while, uh, keep that in mind. I do uh, encourage drafts more than usual this time because there are a few changes to the grant announcement, and I want to make sure that uh, I, you include information, an appropriate amount of information in your applications uh, for that. So here is the new requirement that you'll see in the grant announcement that the commission requested. Um, it's actually two items. One, you see all applications should outline a process for contacting institutions and individuals who participate in the board's programs to determine how they have benefited from that program. So basically, we'd like you to go back to, um, now you don't have to do this, have all this settled when you apply, but we'd like for at least have a process pulled together to go back to uh, either regrant recipients or scholarship training uh, recipients or workshop participants or whoever uh, you have programs for and find out, did this help you in what you're doing? Did you use this knowledge to actually carry out a project? Or if it's regrants, um, did you um, work further after completing your regrant project to do more, to seek other funding, or to take on new projects? Uh, the whole idea here is we don't want uh, folks to to do a project or go to a workshop and then just stop there and not continue to advance and move forward. So we'd like to see uh, that you're going back to people and finding out from them how they benefited. The second part is you should have a process for evaluating your programs, determining their effectiveness, and proposing changes. Uh, basically, this is because boards tend to do the same thing year after year which may be working out fine, but we don't always have the information to know that that's the case. So if you can actually have a process that where board members talk about the programming and say, you know, these we have very well attended workshops, we have three times as many regrant applications as we have funding, everything seems to be working well, we're addressing needs that need to be met or that other people aren't addressing. That's still fine. You don't have to change your programs just to make it look like you're, you're uh, um, doing something different. Uh, but also, we like to see maybe you're not getting the kind of regret applications you should be, and either think about changing the program or changing the way you go about soliciting these applications to maybe get more. If you may know that there is a great need for that program, but you're just not getting the response, so we want you to decide on how you might uh, – get more applications, how you might reach out better to get more applications. Same thing for training. Um, you may be offering um, training and, and fewer people are showing up, or maybe you have a waiting list with 40 people on it, which some have had. Deciding maybe we'll change the way we do training. Some people create their own workshops, um, and maybe uh, you want to change that so that you're uh, using pre-prepared workshop, uh, some states use the SAA workshops, others have workshops available from uh, NEDCC or Lyricist or somebody else, and we would pay for those so that you could then not have to charge uh, any money for people to take those. So just we want a process for you thinking about what are we doing now, what's working, what maybe needs to be changed, or what needs to be tweaked um, so that uh, the commission knows that you are looking at your programming uh, from year to year and deciding what you might do. I often get good feedback on these from uh, the meeting minutes that I receive or even in your applications where you say, this was not a good year, so we're looking at that now and we're going to figure out how to get more applications for our regrant program. So that's basically uh, what the commission is looking for. They want to know 
how people are benefiting from your program and that you are offering the most appropriate programming for your state. Once again, that does not mean you have to change everything you're doing, but just uh, verify that it's, it's what you should be doing. Uh, this last bit here is about publicity and outreach, which you may remember from last year when we asked about this. But we're a little more uh, outgoing about it this year. Uh, we like to receive information about your projects for our uh, Facebook page, not just Archives Month material. That's what we were looking for specifically. And we do like to get that, especially because we tend to devote the whole month to Archives Month, the whole month of October. So the more states that can provide us with that ahead of time is useful. Often we don't find the information until the month is half over. So getting Archives Month materials for that, is, but also all your other materials um, that may come out of projects once they've been completed. You don't have to wait until um, your final reports are due to let us know about re things, uh, projects, things that have been successfully completed, um, especially those things that produce online content that we can then highlight. Um, we've had, I think, uh, Colorado and Illinois and a few other states, uh, Kansas, have been featured on our Facebook page fairly recently because of some very interesting projects that their boards have been doing. So send us that information when it's fresh and new so we can put it up. Um, obviously, also send it in your reports. But we like to get this um, so that uh, our daily Facebook uh, page features as many state board activities as possible. Another area that, that the Commission has said they want to emphasize um, is local publicity for regrants and other projects. Uh, basically, I often find that there is nothing online about projects that are uh, funded through the boards. Uh, I'll go to a regrant recipient's website and there will be nothing there about the project and often there will be nothing there that they even have an archives. Even though they may receive three or $4,000 to do an archives project, there's no mention on their actual website that they have an archives. Um, There'll be things about their historical society, their uh, uh, historic site, or their furniture, or their artifacts, or their education program, but there's nothing there about the archives or that a project was done. So we want to push a little more about making sure that there is local publicity, however that may be done, on their own website or through online uh, news sites, if they have uh, a newspaper with an online uh, presence, things like that that mention both the board and the NHPRC and the National Archives. What we found is if, if they include that the money came from the National Archives, that can get picked up more broadly. If it just mentions the NHPRC, that doesn't always get as much attention. But the National Archives uh, will often give you free extra publicity because um, some other uh, outlet picked that up. So we try to have to push this uh, we'll be providing some more information about what we need. Um, when I read your reports, basically I'll say, we were unable to find anything about this project, um, so you need to, to have future applicants uh, pay more attention to this. Uh, so publicity is going to be uh, a big issue. We're going to hound you about it until you're tired of it, um, and hopefully uh, get some better uh, publicity for all of us about what we're doing, even if it is small-scale projects, they're still important locally. So that's all that I have for you today. All right, thanks, Dan. All right, next up we have a presentation from the Arizona State Archives by Dennis Priestler and Laura Palma Blanford. Dennis Priestler is the Arizona State Archivist. He has a bachelor's degree in history and political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He received his master's degree and PhD in history from Arizona State University, focusing his studies on American history, public history, and the history of the American West. He began working for the Arizona State Archives in 2012 and was promoted to State Archivist in August of 2019. He is very involved in promoting and assisting the archival community in Arizona. Laura holds a BA in History from Indiana University Southeast and an MA from Arizona State University in Public History. 
Laura has worked at the State Archives since 2007 and became the Deputy State Archivist in 2019. Laura loves archives and is happy that she gets to use her history background daily. She enjoys spending time with her family, reading, baking, and watching Star Trek. Hello. Can everybody hear us? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. So I'm Dennis Preisler, and I'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. And uh, Laura's here with me. So to the next slide. Get it. There we go. So our um, NHPRC grant, currently we uh, get, uh, we write a two-year grant. So we wrote ours starting in, um, we got just rewarded in the, uh, July of 2019. We've got this two-year cycle. Um, NHPRC gave us $32,114 for each of the two years, about $64,000 from NHPRC funding. The state of Arizona provides $20,000, roughly a little bit of that, in matching funds. Um, the bulk of that matching fund is more like uh, matching salaries and that sort of thing. The uh, Secretary of State, who we report to, they do provide $10,000 in funding for our regrant program. Um, our Historic Records Advisory Board consists of <clears throat> 10 members, um, which is archivists, records managers. We have archivists from Arizona State University, Northern Arizona University, uh, Lowell Observatory, the Arizona Historical Society. Um, we have three uh, uh, members of the counties, records officers from the county, so we include uh, that group as well. Um, and so uh, it's a pretty active, pretty active board. Um, we meet on a regular quarterly basis, and uh, um, we have a lot of fun. So it's, it's a great, great program. So I'm going to kind of briefly outline what we've done, and then Laura and I are going to kind of split up these different uh, topics. Um, when, I, when I've gone to COSA and talked about our our SHRAB, one of the things that people get interested in is the Arizona Archives Summit, and Laura will be talking more about that. Um, recently, we started a new program called the Professional Archivist Development Program, which is real, we're real excited about that. And starting really early on in our interaction with NHPRC, we started creating an action plan, which incorporates NHPRC's goals, our own Historic Records Advisory Board goals, um, and how we, our objectives, and that's the thing, and how we're trying to meet them. It also talks a little bit about um, what we do. Uh, we have some continuing education programs that NHPRC helps fund, and we've done a number of different previous projects, which we'll include as well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Laura here. So as Dennis said, the Arizona Archive Summit is one of the uh, bigger things we do every year. And the summit, actually, the idea for it started out in the early 2000s under Dr. Melanie Sturgeon when she was the state archivist. Uh, they actually, it started out as just a, a one-day roundtable where we would encourage all the archivists from around the state to come down, get together, and so just to catch up. Now, in 2008, that's when Melanie uh, and I think Rob Spindler uh, from ASU, they wrote the first major NHPRC grant that covered for the summit. And the grant funding was written to accommodate travel so archivists from outside of Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix is based, could actually travel down to Phoenix and spend more than a day here. So now the summits are two days. Yes, and they also pay for hotel rooms for uh, the people from out of the county. Now the summit, the main goal is really for us, all the archivists, to get together and engage in statewide cooperation in collecting and presenting ideas about uh, all our various collection policies. And as we've gone on, we've tried to include more of the records managers as well. So we're trying to encourage participation by many points in the whole records life cycle. And we typically get anywhere from 70 to 90 people per day participating, and it includes as, as Laura mentioned, people from all over the state. We've also been very pleased because we've gotten a number of the tribal communities uh, to participate as well. So 
the first true archive summit was held in 2009. And in that first summit, we brought in Mark Green, Greg Thompson, and Tim Erickson. And it was really, it was a great uh, presentation by them. They were really in depth. They held breakout sessions. And they were really here to get people thinking about what we could do as a profession in Arizona. And during this first session, we discussed a lot about uh, cooperative collection development. Uh, Deaccessioning and re repatriation was really big because uh, the Heritage Center in Wyoming was going through their own deaccessioning process at that time, so that was very fascinating. Uh, doing backlog surveys and, of course, the always popular MPLP. And so we've held them every year. Uh, in 2013, uh, we brought in a, another partner to help put on the summit, and that's the Arizona Archives Alliance, AZA. And AZA's role is to help uh, with the summit by purchasing lunches and defraying some of the cost of bringing in some of those speakers. So uh, in our first uh, summit, we did tackle collection development policy. Some of the other things we've tackled since then is a collections matrix, and I'll actually go further into that one towards the end of our presentation. As Dennis already mentioned, it's been a great way to bring in the tribal archives previous or prior to the summit. Uh, there wasn't a lot of participation by the tribes, and since they do form such a significant part of our state, we really wanted to include them. Other topics we've tackled is the qualitative and quantitative value of archives because we needed to have a way to show our stakeholders what our true value is. We've also had sessions on promoting archives, uh, technologies, processing strategies, tips and techniques. Those are always big. We usually have something at each summit in regards to something. And the l most recent ones we've been doing have been really focused on the Native American protocols, which were um, spearheaded by or worked on greatly by Northern Arizona University. And so they've come down and for the past two summits, they've done a lot of work on teaching people about the protocols and helping them get them implemented within their own institutions. Okay. So our takeaways from the summit is one, the funding that we receive really does help make, make it statewide. Arizona is a very big state. <laughs> um, and for, so for some of these institutions and the archivists in these institutions to come down to Phoenix, they're looking at a, in some cases, could be a six-hour drive. So because of the generous funding where we help get them lodging in the county, they're able to actually come down and participate fully. Uh, it's a great way for the archives, Arizona archives, to brainstorm about future projects. I would, I would hazard a guess to say most of our big statewide projects come by us just networking at the summit and talking amongst ourselves and figuring out where we need to work. Gossip, we always catch up amongst ourselves on what's going on. So it's an opportunity for institutions to show off any new projects that's just specific to them, new spaces. Another great thing is, we, so for the new professionals in the state, it's great because you come to the summit you get to pretty much meet probably, I'd say, about 75% of the archivists in the state. 
because we're all there in one location. So we're able to put faces to names and uh, I personally use it to scope out potential new leaders for our profession in this state because we do a lot of projects and we're always looking for people who are willing to help out. So the summit is a great way to do that. It's also a great for the smaller institutions. They get to come down, they get to participate. There's, um, so some of the smaller institutions I know they get together and have lunch together and they talk about issues affecting them. It's also a way for the smaller institutions to pick the brains of those of us at the larger places on possible solutions. And I know I've gone and helped some of the smaller institutions with some of their um, projects when they just needed a quick extra hand, and I've done that through the summit. Mm -hmm. All right. So one of the new programs that we did was um, in, in the previous grant cycle, and we continue to in this grant cycle, was what we call the Professional Archivist Development Program. So the first round was in 2018. The idea was that we got funding um, for five uh, professional archivists to um, go into other institutions to learn a little bit about um, what the bigger institutions are doing. So NHPRC has generously given us $1,000 per participant to defray cost of room and board, hotel, traveling, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a real exciting program. We did have some issues getting off the ground first year because uh, a lot of the institutions were a little nervous about accepting them, thinking it was an intern program. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, what it is, is for practicing archivists to um, come to an institution for a week. And so we'll have archivists from smaller institutions will go to the larger institutions. And the larger institutions are the State Archives of Arizona, Arizona State University, Northern Arizona University, University of Arizona, the Historical Society, and this last year we had the Center for Creative Photography participate. So we get archivists who oftentimes are loan arrangers and that sort of thing, uh, and or in small institutions who don't have all the professional background, but have some, and they get to work in the larger institutions and they work with everything from accessioning to reference work and uh, processing, that sort of thing. Um, what we do is uh, we, when the participant uh, uh, applies, we make sure that they, they check with their boss first because they're going to be away from week, work for an entire week. And uh, that's something that we don't want to have an issue come up about that. Um, so that's a real interesting thing. Now, the archivist, what they do is we have an application process. The um, interested archivist will submit the application. And they, they're in the application, there's a list of skills that they want to do, everything from accessioning to processing to reference work to, it's, I think we've got about 15 or 20 different skill sets. Um, we have a committee which consists of members of our, our SHRAB um, that they go ahead and they take the archivist, they determine who is qualified, and then they end up going uh, and talking to institutions to try to match them up with the archivist and what their skill set. So it's, it's real important that what we're trying to do is make it a very productive week for both the archivist and for the um, archival institution. Um, some of the uh, takeaways are that uh, skills tackled by applicants. We got a lot of people who are interested in electronic records. Um, uh, collection management systems is, are also very, very important. And you can see appraisal and accessioning conservation. Um, it's good for the accidental professions who we had uh, a woman, Betty Murphy, from uh, the Heard Museum, and she, by her academic training, is a librarian, but she accidentally has become the uh, archivist for the Heard Museum. And so she had a basic knowledge of archives, but when she came in and worked with us for a week, she came away with a, a greater understanding of uh, you know, what it is that we do. So what we're really trying to do is, is to help broaden the knowledge base of um, the archivists that don't necessarily have the opportunity to interact with archivists, other archivists on a regular basis. Um, we're looking at wanting to expand it possibly into doing some stuff with records officers because many of our records officers deal with permanent and archival records, so we're trying to help get them involved in what we do. The biggest thing is it's not an internship. Um, that was when I kind of mentioned earlier that we had a hard time the first year getting institutions to line up. Everybody said, we don't have time. 
for an, for an intern. And uh, so the first year we, we managed to get, um, uh, Kelly Horton came in, she was from Scottsdale Public Library. She came to the State Archives. She worked for a week. At the end of the week, she wrote a report. And then uh, uh, myself, I wrote a report too about what we did. And that gave the committee something to base it on when they went out to, to uh, try to encourage um, both participants and participating institutions. So since then, we've had no problem getting either participants or participating institutions um, involved. At this point, it's just limited to in-state host institutions. It would be really cool if we could have some people out of state, but that's not part of the way the grant is set up. Um, but with the $1,000, we can bring somebody in from, say, Mojave County, which is across the state, as Laura mentioned, and they can come in and they spend a week in Tucson or Phoenix and get to know it. Now, one of the things that we have found um, more than anything is the feedback that I've gotten is both the institution and the archivist participating has said a lot of it is just interacting. Because these smaller institutions, they don't necessarily have, they may be the only one archivist in the museum or historical society, and they don't get a chance to really talk and interact with um, other archivists. So that's been a real positive thing, and it's helped us to grow a real sense of togetherness amongst um, our, uh, the archival community here in Arizona. So that's that's really important part of the whole thing. Um, We've, got, we've done five of these so far, and it's been very positive. Right now, the uh, subcommittee is um, looking at doing two more this spring, um, and so they're, they're in the process. They've got three applicants, and they're gonna decide which of the two applicants, and then they'll line them up with the institutions. So it's a real fun program. It's new. Um, it has been, there's been a few bumps in the road, but we've managed to uh, navigate everything, so it's, it's, we're real happy with this. So, the next thing we have is plans, plans, plans. Um, in 2005, the Arizona Historic Records Advisory Board created its first long-range plan called Protecting Arizona Document Heritage. This really kind of arrived, sort of grew out of the um, uh, roundtable that, that Laura mentioned earlier, and it was um, archivists from NAU, UVA, AHS, um, and ASU, along with the State Archives, that got together and started to talk about what can we do to promote and develop the archival permission profession in Arizona. Um, and so that was kind of the first action plan that we did. Uh, in 2008, we, well, at first it was just a, a long range plan. In 2008, we created an action plan that covered the years 2008 to 2012. And that was where we sort of talked about um, how do we match up with the goals of NHPRC and an archival profession, that sort of thing, and where we're going in Arizona. The action plan emphasized access, preservation, promotion, and education. Um, so we talked about how we want to expand access and all of those, those, those different um, uh, fields. Uh, it also defines ARAB's role in the historical records community and our overall goals and identifies our objectives. So we're continuing doing that. Um, the uh, image to the left is the cover of our 2018-2022, our newest action plan. Um, so in 2013, we created uh, um, to cover the, the, the first one we did was cover 2013 to 2017. We want our third action plan, which is 2018 to 2022. Um, NHPRC provides us funding in order to print these out. So they're a nice professional looking thing. They're about 20 pages and we have images in there, the whole thing. It's, it's a real nice um, piece. It can, it's very good for going out there and talking to stakeholders, whether it's legislators, you know, city councils, board members, that sort of thing. It really helps because it, it's a very detailed and descriptive thing of what we do. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was uh, participated in the COSA's archives on the mall, and I took a handful of them with me, and I handed them out to as many of my members of the Arizona congressional delegation as I could. Um, that was that was very fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. As I mentioned, with the takeaways, is a great tool. The action plan is a great tool to be able to hand out to stakeholders. Everything from my boss, the Secretary of State, to legislators, to if you're in a museum or something, hit your board members, they really are fun. Um, the big thing is it helps with the previous funding projects for, uh, we list all of the other projects that are on our regrant program that we've done throughout the last 10 years or so that we've been doing this. So when we do the regrants and people call me up and they say, um, what sorts of projects do you fund? we can just refer them to the action plan and they can go through the, the, the 10 years that we've been doing this and they can see what kinds of programs they were doing. It helps give them an idea of what to apply for when they do the regrant program. 
Another thing is when we have new board members, this gives them a chance to really find out what it is we're doing. We like to give it out early to some of them who maybe not real familiar, and that way they don't get nervous at what they're getting into. Um, so it's really important to do that. And the big thing, like I said, it showcases the projects that are supported by both ARAB and NHPRC grant funding. The other thing that we do and we've been doing for quite some time is a continuing education program. We run two workshops, a disaster preparedness, emergency and disaster preparedness workshop and an archives 101. These are day long workshops. The emergency disaster preparedness workshop is really geared more towards institutions, um, also county agencies and that sort of thing, counties and agencies. Uh, it focuses a lot on everything from being prepared for your disaster, otherwise, in other words, you know, one of the things we emphasize is identifying where your essential records are. And, and if you had an emergency, how do you get to your essential records to keep your operations going? Um, a lot of what we try to do is we try to talk about prevention before we talk about the um, actually, you know, taking care of things when disasters happen. Um, and we found that they, we actually get a lot of interest from institutions, facilities people, and risk people because we talk a little bit about risk avoidance and um, about, uh, you know, how to look for, throughout your building to see where the potential problems are. Um, and then we have some good workshops, uh, good information about how to deal with a disaster when they happen. Archives 101 is really geared more towards small institutions that don't have a professional archivist on staff. Arizona, we have just we have dozens and dozens of small institutions that have, are run by volunteers, maybe have one paid staff person and are staffed by volunteers. And so the 101 goes out there and we talk about everything from how to properly folder um, uh, documents to how to create a processing plan. I mean, we talk about how to properly remove staples. It really gets down to some of the you know, nitty gritty. Um, and we really like to have, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our regrant program later. We, emphasize with the smaller institutions that if they want to apply for a regrant, if they don't have a professional archivist, we want them to um, participate in an Archives 101 class so that we make sure that they have at least a basic hands-on knowledge of how to be an archivist. And so this is really quite popular. We usually, we do three disasters and three archives a year, and we'll get anywhere from eight to 15 people in each one. Um, so they're really good, and NHPRC provides funding we give them um, a small, one of the small flip top boxes. Um, and in the um, Archives 101, we have a, the proper type of acid free folder. We have some cotton gloves. We have um, an, the proper eraser, the, uh, the proper tool for removing staples, and a few other things like that. So they come away with a little bit of a, you know, a, a gift. Um, with the disaster um, workshops, we do the same thing. We also include the, uh, the disaster wheel, which is the colorful little thing that's down in the right hand corner which helps you walk through that. We also um, tap into some of COSA's, uh, um, the tools that they have, and we give them those things. And so we walk away with that. So that's, that's, that, those things are handed out because of the NHPRC uh, grant funding that we have. Um, so it gives the institutions an idea of what they need. So um, one of the things that we have in our disaster preparedness workshops, we include the, uh, the masks, the, for wearing in case you want to protect yourself from mold, which I guess those things are hard to get nowadays. <laughs> so um, my, uh, my uh, conservation, my conservator went and made sure that all of our masks were secured so that they didn't walk off. So, <laughs> all right, turn it over to Laura. So I'm gonna review some of the previous projects which we've been able to tackle using um, the money. Uh, and ARAB support. One of the big ones was the Landmark Cases Committee. And in this project, the board members actually got together with mem judicial officials, judges, lawyers from around the state, and they actually sat down and they figured out what of Arizona's cases were historically significant and needed to come to the state archives. Um, so that includes, of course, you've got a lovely picture of Miranda there on the left-hand side. Uh, other cases they went through and identified 
were uh, cases in which there was the first time an accusation was accepted from someone's deathbed. Uh, his uh, wife turned out she killed him and he fingered her on his deathbed. Uh, other, one of the other things the committee did is it also um, identified a procedure for getting a case designated as significant and getting it transferred to the state archives. And we've had some judges go ahead and use that procedure. So for example, it's only one page, but we got uh, Jared Lofner's um, traffic court case. Uh, a judge actually sent it to us as historically significant. Um, that's the uh, the guy that uh, shot Gabby, Gabby Giffords down in Tucson. Uh, one of the other interesting cases we've gotten is, this was another justice court case, but it had to do with poaching. And in that case, the judge determined that it was historically significant, and I got a letter and I got it in the, I had to go down and pick it up. One of the other projects that we had done was a report on underdocumented communities in Arizona. And this one was done in 2006. One of uh, actually my uh, public history cohorts, she actually did it. And she actually did a survey of all the archives around the state and really took a look at their collections to identify what we had, but more importantly, what we didn't have and who was not actually being recognized in our collections. And so I've given you a quick snapshot there. These are it's a, probably about, a, I think about a 10 page report, um, but she did fairly good at figuring out where our blind spots were. And the underdocumented communities report started out as the first step in what became the archives matrix. Uh, this is another joint project between uh, the Arizona Historical Records Advisory Board and the Arizona uh, Archives Alliance. And this was truly a statewide project. The idea came about from that underdocumented survey. It was sort of fleshed out at one of the archive summits and then we just did it. And so it took about a year, I would say, so about a year of planning and a year of implementation. And it was built off of the previous survey, but it was much more comprehensive. And every all the participating archives went through each collection we had and we had to identify a primary subject for the collection and a secondary uh, subject matter for the collection and time periods and extent and it was really enlightening. <laughs> so um, through it we were able to sort of help quantify the extent of unprocessed collections and access in the underdocumented communities. We've used it as a tool to eliminate competition for collections and reduce overlap. We've discovered that some of us had dueling collections of the same thing, and in some cases we've determined who should be the actual repository for those records. Uh, it was an exercise for those institutions that didn't have a defined collecting scope. Researchers, and I've used it for our researchers as well, it's a great tool because it provides a snapshot. They can search it to identify collections that they cannot find through traditional means because the matrix did cover some of the backlog and unprocessed stuff. 
Uh, and as I said before, it does identify the split collections and reunite them with each other. Now, I didn't link to the website, but the website is listed on this slide that you can go to. And if you do it, all the data was made available through this website. And if you go to the website, you can download all the results, you can search it by institution, you can look at it by subject matter. Uh, if you want to find something in an Arizona archives, it's going to most likely be listed in the matrix. Uh, the data is about 10 years old now, and I have heard at our last summit there's talk about updating it, which would be another year-long project. But I found that when we can convince the archives community that it's a valuable resource, they'll get behind it and work on it for us. So the last thing we're going to <clears throat> talk about is the uh, our grant program, our regrant program. Um, uh, we started it out uh, early on. Uh, we got a Rota grant, and NHPRC gave us ten thousand dollars initially, and uh, we tried to match it with ten thousand dollars of uh, state funds. Um, the first year we just had the ten thousand dollars because we were getting it off the off the ground. So we had five institutions receive grants ranging from one hundred dollars to three hundred three thousand two hundred sixty dollars. In 2017-18, when we rewrote our, our NHPRC grant, we increased the request from NHPRC to $15,000, and we continued to match it with $10,000. Um, this has been a really fun program. As a member of the ARAP board, this is where you get to have fun, because you get to look at stuff and, and give out money and look at worthy uh, applicants. Um, we can get up to uh, applicants in many years, we'll have up to seventy to eighty thousand dollars worth of application funding applications. So the board has to work really hard to be able to winnow it down to twenty five thousand um, dollars. One of the things that I do as the coordinator here is, if it's a new institution I'm applying for the first time, I will often go out and visit with them to make sure that what they're applying for actually falls within the guidelines for NHPRC and ARAB. Um, so, for example, we had an institution that wanted to, bunch, to purchase a bunch of archival boxes. When I went out to look at the institution, it was all they wanted to house magazines in the boxes, and I had to say, no, we don't fund that. Um, but I do work closely with them to try to find ways to get funding out there. And uh, we've had some real fun uh, projects uh, a few years back, the White Mountain Apache Tribe. They asked for $500 just for some boxes, and so I was able to work with them, got a chance to meet with the, uh, the tribal community and that sort of thing. Um, we've had a number of uh, uh, grants wanting to uh, purchase data loggers. Um, we do some digit, they, you can do some digitization projects, that sort of thing. Um, there's a real cool project that we did last year, um, Lowell Observatory, which is up in Flagstaff. And if you don't know, Lowell Observatory was the, one of the astronomers there who was the first person to observe Pluto. And over a period of about 60 years or so, Lowell Astronomy took um, images of the, the sky at night um, on these glass plate negatives. And uh, we ended up giving some grant money to the, for them to rehouse the, or house the glass plate negatives in the proper, in proper uh, archival storage. Um, we end up, uh, one of the requirements for the, uh, um, for the applicants who get um, a grant is we, we ask them to send letters to every one of the Arizona congressional delegation, everyone who's in the Arizona congressional delegation, so that they're aware that this NHPRC funding has been going out. And that's what's really nice about the action plan, because you can look in there and you see all these small institutions, big institutions all across the state that get funding through NHPRC, and they do the really, really worthy projects we're doing that. And uh, they, in many of these institutions, they do follow through, and they send out letters. I just got the, um, a packet back from the Superstition uh, uh, Mountain Little Historic Society, and uh, they had diligently sent a letter out to everybody. Um, I understand that earlier this year, um, the Mojave County Historical Society, which had gotten a grant for um, housing and some maps, historic maps, and they actually got a, a member of uh, Arizona Senator 
Kirsten Cinema staff came out to the museum and toured it and said a lot of good things. Um, I've had institutions say that they've gotten letters from Arizona's other senator, Martha McSally, um, talking about the wonderful things. So as Dan was talking about earlier on, um, we really try very hard to make sure that um, our congressional delegation is very much in, you know, in the loop and knows what good things um, NHPRC money is doing for the state of Arizona. And it's a lot of fun because you go out there and you really make a difference, particularly in the smaller institutions and that sort of thing. But we also have the larger institutions write some grants and get some good things going there. Um, and I'm not sure how we're doing on time. We're good. We're good? All right. We timed that out perfect. <laughs> so uh, I, just, I just want to add one more thing is that Laura and I are really the beneficiaries of a lot of really hard work that was done earlier on by Dr. Melanie Sturgeon, uh, Rob Spindler, Linda Whitaker, and Karen Underhill. They were the impetus for getting the NHPRC program and getting our, our, our SHRAB up and running. And so most of this work is just, we're, Laura and I are building on what people did before. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Dennis and Laura. We have some time for we have some time for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in on the chat box. And we had two that came in earlier for Dan, and then I see one for Dennis and Laura too. So I'll start with the questions for Dan. Um, Dan, we had a question that came in while you were talking about the new reporting requirements. And the question was, if your state hasn't done a grant in many years, are these new requirements something that could be satisfied through a survey? Yeah, I saw that from uh, Rhode Island. And uh, if you are a state that uh, has not had a grant recently, basically what we would look for primarily is that you have reached out to people in your state to find out what their needs are um, because you haven't done any programming or you've done limited programming with your own funding, uh, we, don't, we wouldn't expect you to have a lot of information on what of the results of your previous programming had been. So basically we would want to see here's information we've gathered um, or that we will gather during the grant. Once again, things don't have to be done before you've applied. Uh, and then develop programs that address those needs and then have a process to say, and six months, nine months, 12 months, whatever period after people have completed their regrant projects or have attended their workshops or whatever they've done, we will then use this mechanism to reach out to them and find out how they used it. So if, you're, if you are not a recent recipient of a grant, uh, the process would be something you do in the future to find out information about the projects that you're proposing to do rather than things that you've done in the past. All right, thanks. And then one more that came in for you, which is, do you keep demographics on the SHRAB? For example, what types of institutions and collections the members of SHRABs represent? We have some uh, information. When people apply to us, they have to include a, um, they have to. We hope that they will remember to include a uh, list of their board members. And so we do know uh, both title and institution. Some states, um, interestingly enough, uh, provide us with personal contact information. So we don't know what these folks are doing. Uh, we have to go and check up on them and see who they are and what they're doing. Uh, and then there are, of course, uh, retired folks um, who we then ask what they did <laughs> before they retired. So we have some kind of scattered information uh, that kind of shows us that uh, many state boards are made up of uh, college and university archivists and local government archivists. And usually uh, larger boards, like I, I had a call in with the Illinois board about three hours ago, um, they're all over the place. They have city government, county government, uh, colleges and universities, uh, historic societies, museums, all kinds of folks, because they have a fairly large board. So we have some information, and if you're kind of interested in knowing, you know, what kind of people are on other boards, um, we can share that with you, since that uh, their um, professional information we can share. We can't share the ones that have personal information, uh, if you're just kind of curious about that. 
Um, so we'd be happy to share that if you want. All right, thank you. Dennis and Laura, we have a question that came in that's asking, how did you develop and maintain the list of repositories in Arizona for the summit and the matrix? And how inclusive is it? Does it include historical societies, libraries, museums, in addition to archival institutions? Um, Arizona is big in size, small in population. <laughs> um, so the list of repositories for the matrix are primarily institutions that are archives heavy. That is their primary focus. We didn't include the libraries and um, the museums in the matrix. So the matrix is strictly the archival repositories. Now, for the summit list, uh, we piggyback off of, I mentioned earlier, the Arizona Archives Alliance, and that's a nonprofit that uh, many of the archivists belong to, um, and so we, OZA itself funds some other small projects throughout the year, and we piggyback, piggyback off the OZA membership, so we capture a lot of the archivists that way. Uh, also, a couple of our board members, so we've got Janice Klein, she's with the Museum Association of Arizona, and so she spreads the words out to the museum community. And then uh, in some cases we use our own resources because we have, one of our duties is of course is records management. So we uh, send out emails to the records managers through their contacts. And then the State Library, we are, uh, uh, we are a division with, State Library is another division in our agency, so we use some of their resources to get the word out. All right, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our presenters today. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah, and I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa. Thanks, Abby, and again, I'd like to echo that. Thank you to our presenters. That was very informative. So now, of course, for every webinar, you got to pay for it. We've got a few commercials, and, and but interesting information you may want to know. So um, this year's theme for our member webinars is called Hot Topics, and so here's the next four webinars that we have. Uh, just a note for, for April, instead of it being the fourth Thursday, it's actually the fifth Thursday for that particular month. But definitely check them out if you want to register, go to the website, and we'll be glad to take you up. Also, Sari has some great webinars, too. So here's the next couple of those that you might be interested in. Again, go to the COSA website, and there'll be a registration page for those. And we're excited about this one because we, uh, what we started the last couple of years is we now have quarterly webinars with staff members from NARA. And so we just got the April 9th one set. And it's going to be on MPLP, and so we've got uh, someone from NARA who's going to be talking on it, and then Abby, who you just heard a little bit ago. Abby's going to be our uh, person at Wisconsin that's going to talk about what's happening at the state level, so sign up for that. And then another thing COSA does is we allow a number of our uh, sponsors, uh, if at a certain giving level, an opportunity to reach out to you, the archival community, and so April 2nd will be one of those shop talks, them to, to, it's not a sales pitch, but it's a way for them to share what they are working on. And so April is going to be, uh, Ancestry has a division called newspapers.com, and they're going to talk about what they do and some of the neat things that have been happening in there that might be of interest to archivists around the country and the world. And then, of course, we've got events coming up, and so you want to take advantage of those. Uh, Sunshine Week uh, best practices, if you're looking for a great place to, to uh, exchange ideas and get some information in Raleigh, North Carolina this year. Uh, COSA Mid-Year Board Meeting is, is meeting in Washington, D.C. in April, and then they'll also have the Washington Partners Briefing, so uh, that'll take place then. And then 
uh, Nagara's conference is in Denver in July, and our own annual conference along with the SAA meeting will be in Chicago in August. Naturally, we can't do any of this work without funding from our sponsors, and we appreciate all of you, so thank you to our sponsors. And we want to hear from you. We want you to stay connected to us, and there's lots of ways you can connect to COSA, so these are just several of them. We do appreciate your feedback. So it's very important if you, when you get, when you exit here and you get that little story, please take a minute and finish out. It really does help us as we put together new programs. The Education Committee looks at it and it helps them help identify what are, what are we providing for you, what do we need to do more of, what would you like to see. So do please take a minute to do that. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank our presenters. It was informative. Lots of great ideas if you've got a shrap and, you know, things you could be doing, things. So we are going to try and see if we can send out that action plan um, to everyone. But if not, I had put my email in there so you can just email directly and I'll make sure you get a copy. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great rest of the day, a great rest of the week, and enjoy your extra 24 hours. So everyone, have a great week. Thank you for joining us for the COSA February member webinar.